Florida State has officially landed 2022 defensive tackle Aobami Tafasi, a six foot four, 310 pound prospect out of Maryland, showing that we are not dead on the recruiting trail and that even though he's 55, Odell Hagens has still got it. We break down this recruiting and more next on Locked On Seminoles. You are Locked On Seminoles, your daily podcast on the Florida State Seminoles, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yeah, folks, thanks for being here. Thanks for coming back day after day, night after night, depending on when you like to partake in Locked On Seminoles. We are Max and Dave, two Florida State alumni, two lifelong fans of the university. We've been covering the team for, isn't this crazy, man? A collective four years now? Yeah, wild. Thanks yeah, for I, joining along the ride. You add in your time in the sports information office in college, and you know we're, we're, we're pushing a collective decade here almost, yep. so... It's pretty wild. And, you know, guys, we only are girls too, folks. We only get to do this because uh, y'all come back every single day. I mean, y'all are here during the off season. We are like, what, months and months away from football season. And you're still here with us every day, three days a week, at least during the off season. So thank you for that. Now, Dave, today, as we mentioned, we're going to talk some recruiting, some commits. You know, we got a question on Monday of, why does FSU seem to have no momentum relative to UF and yeah. Miami? And it, it wasn't an unfair question, but this week, I mean, we've kind of nailed it. You know, we had a 2023 safety commit to us. We had a top JUCO prospect for 2023 commit to us. And today we landed Obami, a Obami Tafasi, a defensive tackle. He is six foot four, 310 pounds out of Baltimore, Maryland. He chose FSU over Arkansas and Virginia Tech. Now, what's interesting about AO is he was originally in the 2022 class. He's extremely young. I don't know when his birthday is exactly. I'd have to look it up again, but I know he's 17 right now. So he, during COVID, with everything happening, had reclassified himself to graduate a year later and thus be a part of 2023. Well, when everything started to pick back up, he started to get interest from Power 5 D1 schools. He decided to potentially re, re-reclassify back into the 2022 class. So it's a little weird to follow, but he decided to graduate later, then changed his mind. So he actually is going to enroll at Florida State, I believe, tomorrow. That was the last I heard was he planned to enroll tomorrow. And he will be part of the 2022 roster. Now, an important note, Dave, is... He's not just a red shirt. He's going to have to be an academic red shirt. I imagine that's going to be something to do with reclassifying and reclassifying. And that means he doesn't get the four games, but he can still practice with the team. It's better than a blue shirt. He's not going to have to wait till spring to go to practice. He's going to be in workouts all summer. And yeah, so that's one position that we're fair. We feel fairly good about uh, the interior D line. So if we're relying, I don't care how talented on true freshman recruits, that's uh, something's gone terribly wrong. So I wasn't expecting him or really any of the incoming D linemen to, you know, be playing substantial minutes. And so the fact that he's not going to play at all really isn't that big of a bummer. He'll still be here in the weight program. And that's, what's important for, for these incoming uh, interior D linemen. Yeah. You know, for me, I, I, I agree. Um, that he probably isn't going to need to contribute as a freshman. It's just with the, with the new, um, uh, with the new, um, uh, what do they call the new rule where they can play four times? Sorry, I lost my train of thought for a moment trying to look up one of his stats. I want to share with y'all. Um, I, I would have liked to see him, you know, be able to play in some games this year because you know we're not going to be world beaters this year, but there's going to be a couple blowouts on this schedule. I think. Syracuse, you know, late in the year, it'll be good. You'll want to see a lot of freshmen get time, but I, I'm not going to lose a lot of sleep over this. Um, what I wanted to look up was a picture of this kid because it's terrifying. Yeah. I mean, the fact that he is 17 years old is like, you know what it reminds me of? Do you remember Amobi Okoye, that kid that played for Louisville when he was like 16 years old and got drafted at 19? 
I didn't know about mm-hmm. him. No, that's kind of what it reminds me of. Yeah. So he looks the part. I mean, he's a big athletic guy. He, yeah, he'll be a good spot on the D line. I think there, Dave, there's two things about this recruitment. I really like, like when I'm, when I'm thinking about it, I'm like, okay, this is why I'm jazzed up. Number one, it shows Odell is still got it. Yeah. Right. Okay. This was a kid who up until like a few months ago, wasn't even going to be in this class, was going to be a year later. And Odell was able to get him on campus and close him. And two was who we beat out. Yep. Beat out Arkansas. We beat out Virginia Tech. Yep. Don't care as much about Virginia Tech, but here's also Miami. Also Miami. Them. But but Dave, I, I want I want your perspective on this. I I actually really like seeing an Arkansas beat out because there's this yep. narrative, and it's not wholly incorrect, that because the SEC is getting more money, we're all doomed. Could be true. I mean, gosh, look at the baseball college world series right now. If you count Texas and Oklahoma. Six of the eight teams are either current or future SEC teams. Yeah. So clearly the money has a factor. And I think that Arkansas and Ole Miss are the type of programs that people are really worried about when they say like the money is going to wipe us out of relevance. It's not Bama. We're already behind Bama. Yep. We already are going to have to compete with LSU and Georgia. But if the Arkansas of the world start passing us, that kind of proves the theory that like it just is all about money and we might as well accept that conference championships are good and national championships are out of reach, which I don't think anyone wants to do. So while it is just one recruit, I think seeing that we can still beat those guys out in a one-on-one recruiting battle type deal is really encouraging as a Florida State fan. Yeah, uh, continues to be at a position of need. That's important. But yeah, I mean, like it's it's also important because we had that conversation about comparing Mike Norvell to other coaches that came came into new schools and sort of similar ish situations. Pittman came into Arkansas um, and made them immediately relevant. So they had momentum. It, it it seems like it would have been an easy sell for Pittman, um, and yet we still beat him out despite this narrative that look at the record, look at the money that's going to the SEC. Like you said, um, that's great to see. He specifically mentioned uh, how many players Odell's put into the NFL over his tenure at Florida State in in why part of why he chose Florida State. Huge deal. Um, so, you know, you'll find those people that think certain members of this coaching staff need to move on. Um, and then you have moments like this that kind of make that should make those those individuals wonder, is is that the kind of continuity that wouldn't otherwise exist on this staff and that we can't afford to lose? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think Odell should move on. I, I will say I was a little not surprised that it didn't happen. I was surprised there wasn't more chatter when we were looking for um, front office staff, right? Like someone to manage director of player personnel, um, you know, GM type roles that that Odell hasn't been more in the talks for that. You know, you think as his career starts to wind down on the field, maybe that's, that's something he could look at. But oh, – <laughs> Odell's not that old. Yeah. Especially He's just been here forever. Coaching. Right. Like people don't retire at 65 in coaching. And Odell Higgins, I believe, I'm going to look it up, but based on when he was here, I, I want to say he's like 58. I don't think he's over 60, is he? He can't be over 60. He went to college in the 90s. He was a pick in 1990. So yeah, so Odell's 55 years old. Yeah. So if he was at a normal office job, he'd have a decade left at least. For him, he might have 67 and still works like full-time yeah. as a lawyer. So, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, you wonder like when people say, oh, maybe it's time for Adele to move on. Like, I don't know. The, the interior D line is probably going to be our best unit this yep. year. He's still out there landing good recruits. Yep. Uh, he provides, again, a layer of continuity that I think this team has shown it desperately needs through all the tumult that was Jimbo leaving, was Willie leaving, and you know now it's the, some of the not ideal win loss scenarios with Mike Norvell and Odell's kind of there through all of it. He's a bridge to both eras of championship Florida State football that I feel like adds an incredible amount of value to a staff that otherwise doesn't know what it feels like to win at that level. That's absolutely right, and you know it's it's kind of making me think back to my comments on the Mike Martin thing. Um, you know where I said, look, I, I don't really care about about tradition. I care about, you know, I mean, I care about traditions, but with coaches specifically, I care less about tradition than I do about championships. And the reality is Odell Higgins has coached two national championship teams. He's coached four teams that have played for it. I think, was he a GA on the 93 team? Was he back yet? I don't think he was back yet. So I think it's coached, no, played for what? So coach, yeah, coach two that won it, 
coached on four that have played for it and coached on a playoff team. Like the guys coached for what, 15 ACC championship winning teams. It's like that to me is, is a, is a type of continuity and a type of just institutional memory that is important to keep around, especially when you have a guy who isn't just here for the paycheck. I mean, I don't want to get, I guess we're getting too far down the road, but whatever, we're already almost there. Um, you know, these, these coaches are humans, right. And they're people. And we, it's so easy to think like about them just as like numbers on a spreadsheet or, or commodities, but he's lived in Tallahassee for like the past 40 years at this point, 35 years, he's built a life here. It's where his kids grew up, all that. So like, as long as he's willing to stay and he can keep landing recruits, there's absolutely no reason to ever move on from Odell Higgins in my well, opinion. And there's a lot of people that listen to this and other podcasts that probably think, I don't really give a shit about like the, the where, how long he's been living, where is he still putting out a good product on the field? The answer is yes. I mean, it, well, like, right. That's the caveat. As the long as the product line is going to likely be our best position this year. And at, at age 55, after 29 seasons, that doesn't seem to be slowing him down. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't know if, look, it, the game passes people by, right? Like that's the biggest concern, but the reality is too, like he's, he's playing, or he's coaching D line, interior D line. It's, it's not, you know, I mean, I'm not saying a word. There's not a ton of evolution that's going to go into interior D line play. There's definitely updates, right? Recruiting changes. Doing something but, right. Look how many players we've gotten picked in the NFL and that interior D line, just the D line as a whole too. Like, yeah. I mean, Jesus. Well, and, and you'll see subtle changes, right? Like, again, he moved from D line to interior and now we have a DNs coach, things like that. Um, yeah. But I, I think uh, looks aside, we have to remember that Odell is only 55 years old and he's still landing new recruits. So yep. uh, before we go on to talk about the Miami news, um, which is which is kind of tying into recruiting and folks, you're not going to want to miss that. I did just want to talk about some other recruits that Florida State landed. Um, Quindarius Jones became a 2023 commit last weekend during the mega camp or the elite camp. Uh, six foot three, six foot two, 185, 190 ish pounds safety, possible cornerback plays a little bit of receiver as well. Now, what's going to happen is y'all are going to go look up Quindarius Jones and you'll go to his recruiting and you'll realize that he doesn't currently have any stars. Um, You're going to hear about that. And, you know, I don't think we're in the business of celebrating picking up no star athletes. But at the same time, um, I do think that this could be more of a getting in early than a taking a kid with no stars because – 247 has updated their recruiting uh, ranking on him, not on the composite, just that site. They've got him at like an 85, 86. And I think that as he develops, you're going to see um, you're going to see his stock rise quite a bit. I mean, you look at some of the videos that came out from the camp. He's just a freakish athlete. Um, if you have a guy that can play DB, we're going to be on him. Marcus Woodson's on him. So I'm confident in his ability to close. But again, it's the 2023 class. So we got to see what he develops into and see if we can hang on to him because like, actually, Dave, I want to talk about this after, after we take a quick break here, but um, I, I, I want to talk about like just the, the concept of like, okay, we're in early. So that means that, you know, maybe we can fend people off, but you know, it's like, if he, what if he jumps up to like a high four star, can we still keep him? And is it bad that that's our Let's talk about that. mindset? Yeah. Um, but first folks, y'all know Bill Bar. Bill Bar is, delicious. It's nutritious. It is everything that you want in a bar, whether it's candy or protein, because this tastes like candy and it hits like protein. It's the best of both worlds. Shout out to the girl, Hannah Montana. You can get whatever flavor you want. I don't care. All I care about is the, is you using promo code locked 15 when you go to built.com to get 15% off your order. Inflation's no joke out there, folks. And I want you to get the best price possible on your built bar. So again, Use promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your order when you go to built.com and pick up your favorite flavor of Built Bars. We had someone today tell us on the uh, on the comments that they loved the coconut, uh, some, some kind of coconut. I think it was Lotto told us um, something. With, oh, yeah. So, so Lance, it was Lance. Lance said he's here to say Muck Fiammy and the coconut marshmallow Built Bar is spectacular. What a fitting segue. Thanks, Lance. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, man, I, 
I just had the thought of like, man, this kid's, uh, you know, he's a three star now in two, four, seven, maybe he jumps to a three star on the composite. The next thing you know, he's a four star. Oh man, kid from it, kid from kid from Mississippi Meridian. Actually, my family's from there. Originally my mom was adopted. It was her biological family. Doesn't matter. But, uh, isn't that like a horrible thought that like what we've been doing on the recruiting trail, like now I'm kind of at the point where I worry a kid is going to get too good. <laughs> like, shouldn't we be hoping that he just gets way better and just uh, know that he'll come to Florida state because we're Florida state. Dude, uh, there's none of that. And the reason you're going to hear the, the answer to that from anybody and everybody until this is undone through several recruiting cycles is Travis Hunter. I mean, seriously, that name is going to cause people to not care about just the fact that a kid is committed early and he becomes good. Like they'll just assume he's going to leave. And why wouldn't you? Um, there was a question on Twitter today, a uh, Twitter poll that somebody posted that said, will Mike Norvell land a composite five-star recruit this cycle? That's an interesting no. question. Who's uh, he, who are we in on? Well, uh, we were in on the number one DB uh, in the class. Uh, don't make me remember his name right now because I'm not going to do that. Drake know, yeah. should be here for that. But um, yeah, I mean, there's going to be, especially when you're recruiting the state of Florida, you, there's always going to be kids that blow up, uh, that go to these smaller schools, that go to, they get to some camps and suddenly it's like, or they hit a growth spurt or something and they blow up. So the kids that we get committed, especially from the state of Florida, Absolutely, we could see them blow up into a high four-star, possibly even five-star type. And yeah, at that point, you absolutely have to be worried, rightfully so, that all of a sudden Bama is going to come knocking. And when Bama comes knocking on a five-star kid's door, look at who how many kids they've had drafted, them in Georgia. As It's a tough sell. That's all I'm going to say, to say don't yeah. go there. Uh, it, it, unless you play like a position like quarterback when you go to Ohio State and there's 18 five-star quarterbacks there. And it's like, oh, wait, can't believe I'm not playing. So. But even then, it's like, you know, I, I mean, Brock Glenn, we're going to at quarterback who we just offered. We're going to have to fight for him uh, with Ohio State. So we'll see. Now, I will say with Quindarius Jones, I, I don't know if Alabama will come knocking. I got to think their class is uh, pretty firm. If it's not firm, they know who's on their board right now. But him being in Mississippi is interesting because what we talked about earlier where Arkansas is kind of a test case against – this idea of, I think Ole okay, Miss too. Like, that's what I was going to say. I think Ole Miss and Mississippi State are both right there. I mean, they're programs that, you know, Ole Miss has had one 10 win regular season ever, yeah. um, but they've been getting better. And Mississippi State was pretty good about a decade ago. And under Mike Leach, they've, I, I don't really know what they've been doing, to be honest, but um, they're, they look like they're getting better, but they're also, they don't play defense. That's, that's a nice way to say it. It's an interesting thing. But that again will show us like, you know, is money so critical to the success of a program that even an average middle of the pack with the potential to be, you know, decent every now and then SEC school going to just mollywop us on the recruiting trail or do other things matter? <sighs> to answer that quickly, the in-state aspect of that matters more to me than the SEC aspect. Honestly, like if we have a kid committed from Texas, I'm going to worry that a Texas school, not that some SEC right, school. That's fair. It, so I don't think the SEC money makes me worry that they're just going to be able to pay these kids crazy amounts of money as much as I worry that like, maybe not so much in the state of Florida, actually, with the fact that like we're all on an even playing field with the NIL where we can't, the schools can't participate in trying to coordinate that. Like those are the two concerns I have uh, in state and NIL money more so than just SEC. Like, um, I uh, that I don't know. I I don't really I don't really share that concern, which is funny for me because you would I've I've said plenty of times I'm real worried about that income disparity. Um, I worry about that with like long term facilities and when NIL just becomes a total pay for play, which is going to happen. That's when I'll start worrying about it. Until then, that's I I think the SEC is the same as it's always been vis a vis Florida State. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. And, and the in-state thing will matter, right? Because I, I just double-checked a map. Meridian, Mississippi is about six hours from Tallahassee compared to, um, I think about, I don't know. I didn't look to Ole Miss and Mississippi, but it's got to be closer, or Mississippi State. It's got to be closer than that. Um, so that'll matter. LSU's right there. But again, I, I don't know if Quindarius Jones is going to be a, I'm not saying he's going to like explode onto the scene and every sec school is going to want him i'm just saying uh it's kind of a weird that our thought process now like that would even 
be a worry. Well, it could become one easily, right? Like, yeah, if, if just some random SEC school, like I, I don't know, like say Vandy just like grabs him all of a sudden. Uh, all right. Well, look, then, that, yeah. yes, that would, that would like, at that point, we might as well watch something else. But <laughs> I, I do think though, the fact that if we beat out a Mississippi state and an Ole Miss, if they get involved yeah. for anyone, really, that shows that like, it's not all about money because um, the SEC having bigger TV deals and more money and caring more, frankly, and having more boosters, like that's not brand new. Yeah. That's been around for seven decades, you know, at this point. So not much to do in Tuscaloosa. Yeah, but I I do want to I do want to talk about um about Miami a bit. I also want to shout out I will be on Locked On LSU tonight with uh Drizzy Drake Rogers and Caroline uh Fenton their host. So really looking forward to that. I'll let y'all know when that drops. And uh also if you're an NBA fan, make sure you check out all the programming we have coming up on the Locked On Network. I know y'all come here every day. You get a little snippet into Locked on Seminoles, and we love you for it. We hope you subscribe, like the video, comment below, all that stuff. But we do have a full network. And um, what's neat about that is when something like the NBA draft's coming up, we can leverage the fact that we've got 32 dedicated team shows for the NBA, plus all the colleges that these draft prospects went to. And you know, you got 60, 70 people covering it. So look up NBA or locked on NBA mock draft. If you're into the NBA draft, check it out. You will enjoy it. But well, speaking of things we enjoy, David, yeah, I don't, I don't know where to start with it. You, you, you filled me in. I hadn't seen this piece of news yet. So what's going on with Miami, our, okay. our folks down south? Well, Miami is a dumpster fire. Uh, that continues to be true. And what happened today, for those who didn't see it, or you know what, for those who did, you get to hear about it again, which is just joyous. The NCAA has apparently decided to make Miami their first case study in enforcement actions against NIL issues. Um, you can go read about it pretty much anywhere. It's on the front of Sports Illustrated right now, for example. Um, the, the NCAA is at the 11th hour uh, with their attempts to kind of wrangle in NIL. They probably missed the boat on it, but they've decided, I guess, to try to make an example out of the University of Miami. Apparently, uh, Mega Booster John Ruiz was interviewed as part of this. Um, how's MSPR doing? Uh, uh, but a little, you know, yeah, just chugging along. 80 something percent down. Uh, anywho, so he was interviewed as part of this. Um, it, look, I don't really care if they did anything wrong. I hope they get the death penalty. I, I hope they don't have a football team anymore. But realistically, I don't I, want, I don't want judicially sound prosecution here. I want, <laughs> I want like. Yes. Fake evidence and well, full blown. No, but but do you have any? Do you seriously have any doubts in your mind that some sketchy uh, crap has gone on down at Miami to get some of the recruits there? Because remember, they had like the eighty something ranked recruiting class. You had to scroll down to like page eleven D on. Yeah, like, yeah, and then and, Mario and suddenly, Cristobal comes in. It, well, here's here's what's going on, and and this is the best way I can explain it to the folks listening, because um, I don't want to I don't want y'all to get you know just like what the heck are they talking about. As we all know, NIL is here. It's 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 popped up. Kids can make money. What the NCAA has decided to do is effectively try to get Capone on tax evasion. So what they are saying yeah. is that the kids can make money. Businesses can pay the athletes money for their name, their image, and or their likeness. However, a booster cannot use that as an inducement to – help a kid choose their school. That's where it gets weird because I don't know the exact statutes we're going to see, but the Supreme court didn't rule on NCAA regulations related to boosters. Um, I know that certain people, some of our dear friends who are on this program have very strong opinions about the NCAA, but the reality is they're the ones for right now that sanction the playing of college football. And if they want to punish you, you can litigate it, but as we've seen in this sport, getting thrown off for one or two cycles can absolutely derail a program. Yeah. So it's kind of the analogy I always use. You know, if, if you're trying to turn right and you've got the right away and a guy runs a red light and you pull out in front of him and he smashes into you, you can be in the right and also die in that car wreck. Yep. So I think boosters probably should be careful. Um, I think this – you look at the collectives popping up and you talk about kids that go to the school. That's great. But 
there needs to be, I think, a little more judiciousness to how we re- reapproach the the inner the intertwinement of recruiting and NIL. Because as much as we want to be the Wild West and everyone can just write kids checks and call it NIL, the NCA is making a very firm statement here. Whether it's just a warning shot or it's going to lead to actual action, they are saying they are not going to let it be Tucson, Arizona. A la 1846. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, I'll, That'd be the Wild West because. Oh, right. right. Tucson. Okay. I don't, I don't associate Tucson with the Wild West. I just. Big town in the West, dude. I don't know. Come on. Anywho. Uh, the irony is that this all was happening long before NIL was allowed. Uh, it's just that people had to be real careful and not leave a paper trail. So now that it's you know, allowed uh, to have these NIL deals, people are getting awfully cavalier uh, about waving money in the air. And of course, that's going to raise some red flags. And they're sure doing it down at the University of Miami. And look, if, like I said, if they want to make, they need to make an example, the NCAA, or this, this might be their last power grab before they cease yeah. to have functional power over college sports, especially college football. And if they can't do it with this, it's going to be just open hunting season for as far as NIL goes, there's going to be no consistency. There's going to be no consequences and that's a problem. So yeah, they, they should come down hard on, on, Miami. My, on Miami specifically. Right. Um, you know, I, 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 I kind of tend to agree that I don't know if they should. I think that's what they're going to do because um, – and, and Drake and I have talked about this on episodes, but I can punch at him because he's not here to defend himself. Um, you know, we had the one episode where, you know, you talked about the NCAA being toothless, and I kind of was like, well, what do you mean? I mean, they're still handing out penalties. I, I think that people got high on their own supply. Um, Drake, this isn't specific to you if you're listening, but they did, right? People heard that the NCAA lost one court case. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the NCAA was this toothless, useless, no good, had no power, all this. And it's like, well, again, they still sanction the sport that we all play, and it may go away in two or three years. But just because you're going to move out of your parents' house in two years doesn't mean that when you're 16, you don't have to listen to them, especially when they bought you your car and they can take your keys away at any point. So the NCAA is still holding the title to the car that is college football. And whether we think we're moving out at some point or not, Again, we have to operate in the paradigm in which we find ourselves. And if people want to pull a Ruiz, you know, tweeting at the NCAA, basically challenging them to come to come get him, well, they're now showing they're going to do it. So part of me is like, yeah, it's good. It's happening to Miami. Part of me is saying this is a cautionary tale to our boosters of like, just, uh, you know, head on a swivel out there, team. Yep. Um, the irony, the last thing I'll say again is you're talking about buying cars but down at miami they lease cars for these recruits so they don't know anything about buying cars down there Um, they don't even buy their stadium they lease that too right everything but it's a long-term lease so it's basically like owning when you think about you just can't great deal you can't change anything on it you know you gotta but you're locked in at a good interest rate so Folks, uh, I'd be interested to hear what what y'all make of uh, the new recruits for Florida State and uh, what y'all think about the Miami situation, both in the enjoying Miami's pain, but also in the implications that it has for college football and NIL as a whole, if the NCAA is still going after programs for it. So thanks for stopping by today. We hope to see y'all again later this week. I'm Max. That was Dave. And this was Locked on Seminoles. Seminoles?